Hi, uh, I'm Alex Hardwicker. I'm a cloud services engineer here at Ocado, uh, and I've been in the cloud services team for uh, about two and a half years. Um, so, some time ago, we made the decision to replatform our services for the public cloud. Um, so, I'm going to talk a little bit about that journey, um, where we are now, and some of the cha uh, choices we've made along the way, and uh, things we learned. Um, so, uh, this is what we'll be covering. Um, where we started out, how we configured our AWS accounts originally, um, how we decided to manage our applications, manage their control, the stack they're running on, how we deployed them, and what lessons we learned. So, starting from scratch is a very daunting task. Um, there are many choices, and there's no right or wrong answer. Um, some people choose to start with something small uh, and learn how to use the platform. Um, other people maybe want to move a development environment or a batch process into the cloud, something that's not too critical to the business. Um, in our case, we were looking to rewrite all our systems anyway in order to run them in the cloud. Uh, and some teams, um, they wanted to use the cloud for existing systems uh, as there's kind of limited capacity uh, on-premise. Um, so we were faced with getting things going uh, quickly. Um, and we had to take a more agile approach to infrastructure, something that typically is not used to moving fast. Um, so we had to learn and train things and just pick the best option that was available to us. Um, one of the big changes is our systems would now be managed by somebody else. Could we trust them with our data? Um, our servers would also be running on shared infrastructure. You know, how, how, what are our concerns about performance if we you know, can't get close to the machine? Um, and everything is now public. Uh, accessible by, in theory, anyone from anywhere, and this carries a high level of risk to it. Um, the answer we found is just to try and always build for failure, uh, expect the worst case scenario, uh, prepare for it and test regularly. We also had to try and balance the needs of our development teams uh, and uh, those of security concerns. Um, how do we allow teams to push code quickly to cloud environments while also keeping the platform secure? How do we not get in people's way? Um, we had a look at cloud success stories, uh, such as Adrian, uh, Adrian Crockford at Netflix. Um, we wanted to learn about the patterns they had used and how they made the cloud work for them. How did they manage their really huge, fast growth? Um, how did they build confidence in using a public cloud? Um, some people had heard bad stories and were worried about whether this was the right choice for us. Um, so we were in this unique position uh, to be able to make a clean start as our systems were being rewritten. Uh, this meant we didn't have to carry lots of baggage. We could look into adopting best practices from the outset rather than adding them later on. Um, we chose to adopt these guiding principles uh, in our strategy for the cloud. Um, one, don't copy on-premise uh, solutions. Don't just lift and shift. Uh, secondly, is don't try and reinvent the wheel. Uh, use available services wherever you, you can. Um, start small and grow. There's uh, much less upfront commitment required in a scalable public cloud solution. And finally, utility billing. Uh, pay as you go. Turn things off when you are done with them. Uh, so there are different service types of the cloud, and we wanted to try and use managed services provided by a service provider wherever possible. Um, why is this? Well, we had a growing list of new tech stacks internally, but didn't always have the time and resources to keep on top of new features and software updates. Um, so by using managed services, uh, we could accelerate our development and systems would improve all the time as AWS were releasing new features, all without any downtime or upgrade pains. Finally, we chose to make sure that the systems we created uh, to manage the cloud would also be hosted in exactly the same way as the uh, development teams were using them. Uh, this is called the dog fooding method. Um, this meant that everyone would be on a level playing field. Both development and infrastructure teams would be operating in the same way and uh, operating under the same constraints. And we'd both be working to improve the, improve the platform and the tools around it. Um, so I've talked a little bit about our strategy. Um, now let's get started on our path to the cloud. Um, some teams had already built systems using Google App Engine uh, and AWS, and the feedback from these people was positive, so we looked at both. Um, why did we choose these and not more traditional service providers? Um, it was for those managed services I mentioned earlier. Um, other cloud providers had 
compute and storage, but fewer of these high-level applications such as NoSQL databases, messaging services, content delivery, caching, things we didn't want to have to build ourselves again. So we had a look under the hood. We deployed some test applications. Um, we spoke to some of these service providers so we could understand and hear more about their roadmaps. Uh, in the end, we chose to use both, but in two different ways. Um, we wanted to be able to run our systems on either provider and not be tied to a single one. Uh, AWS had a head start on Google, but Google were definitely catching up fast in that feature list. However, at the time, it was clear that AWS was better suited for our front-end and operational systems, whereas Google has much better data services and would be good use for our back-end analytical systems. Um, so we chose uh, AWS Elastic Beanstalk to host web services and APIs. Um, well, this is, while Beanstalk is meant as a platform for those getting started in the cloud, uh, it really had some great features that we didn't have on-premise, uh, such as the ability to do things like blue-green deployments. Um, but it still gives you some of that low-level customization, the ability to tweak things to get the most out of performance. Um, AWS services are being uh, added all the time, and they're, there's a lot to learn about and keep up with. So it's fair to say we had a lot to think about. However, the clock was already ticking and the development teams really wanted to get in and get started straight away. So we needed an account to work with, uh, something to develop against and actually deploy to and learn by using. So this was our first attempt at using AWS. Um, we kept it very simple, uh, had a single account called eval for evaluation. Um, we told everyone that we would be working on longer term plans. This was a place where they could get in and get started and we would eventually require them to move on and migrate out into a more mature environment later. Um, so this requires some cooperation and coordination from the teams. Uh, we had regular process updates and knowledge sharing meetings that anyone could attend to answer questions and deal with concerns. Our next attempt uh, joined up the Network Hub account uh, with a VPN back in the head office. Um, we tried to treat our AWS platform as somewhat untrusted and keep it at arm's length. Uh, we had plans for big users of managed services, however these sit outside of your, your VPC or network. Um, so you need to be reaching out to the public internet. So after moving, in, uh, moving into the new account sort of VPC peered model, um, we noticed this had some impact on latency reaching out to managed systems. Um, so we needed to set up uh, some central control systems in the firewall um, that meant that um, you know, traffic could get out and performance would still be quick. Um, and we had to kind of work out what would happen if some of these central control systems failed um, is it possible for development systems to overload uh, production and have some kind of impact there? Um, so the next version, version two, we chose to decentralize all these endpoints and give every single account uh, outgoing uh, internet access to AWS services so they could take the shortest route possible um, to those managed services. Um, so we had to learn kind of how big these accounts would be up front uh, as a VPC would have, can need to have an IP range so that there's a space for services to live in. And all this is connected back via a VPN uh, to on-premises, which again means there's a limited private range available. Um, this method started also to build some dependencies with on-premise systems, and we really wanted the platform to be a clean break from the old. Over time, we sort of added another account, and this was for shared services that needed to communicate with development, production, or testing environment. And this was where we put a large amount of our provisioning, and testing tools, uh, deployment tools, um, so now that we'd settled on a rough account structure um, and we had teams sort of starting to push the applications into the accounts. Um, and I mentioned earlier that we wanted to have the ability to fail fast and, and learn. So what had we learned from this? Um, we originally wanted our new platform to be fully multi-tenanted so it could be very efficient. However, this just isn't very easy to do. Um, we had a lot of time and effort put into ensuring applications could be able to keep their customer data apart from each other. Um, uh, we knew the platform we were building was not intended to be operated by thousands of customers, but maybe sort of 10 or so larger businesses. So we chose to use the AWS account slightly differently. By running only a single customer in each account, um, we could segregate data and keep it fully apart. Um, this meant that it would be easier to tally up the costs of running small or large customer systems. Uh, and the AWS bill broken up by account. Um, what else did we learn? Uh, AWS has account level service limits, so we also managed to break AWS, at least for ourselves. The growing number of teams and large number of services that are being deployed means we would frequently run out of resources in a single account. 
Um, we had to learn that the cloud is not always unlimited to you. Um, many of these limits are soft limits, so we were able to ask AWS for increase, some more, uh, more load balancers or more compute results. And for the most part, they would give us what we want, or we could talk through our requirements in AWS and find out some sort of alternative for these limits. Um, in order to prevent us from running out of something uh, and finding that teams had suddenly stopped working and waiting for us, we created our own reporting tool um, to keep track of all these service limits. So we knew exactly how much of each resource we had in each account. We could uh, count how many we were using. Um, this enabled us to get an early view on when something was running low. We could address the issue before it started to cause a problem. Another issue was throttling. Um, many of these managed services that we're using with AWS, uh, we find that sometimes API calls to them are failing. Uh, this is API throttling. If we were calling an API too heavily, we would find our call set service would be throttled. And this is not just for that application, it's for the whole AWS account. So again, we kind of spoke with AWS and found some ide identified some areas in which we could fix this. Um, for example, we had a large number of developers that are looking at the AWS console in order to better get a look at their systems. Um, they had deployed several hundreds of applications and this just caused the console to be very slow and applications to be throttled. So we created a dashboard um, so the development teams could see the state of their applications. This dashboard was acting as a proxy would make API calls and backend, but was caching that information so that we weren't repeatedly hitting services. By now, we also had growing concerns over our blast radius for failure. So running all of our systems in a single account just may not be the best choice. What happened if we had throttling issues? What happened if we had security breaches or configuration errors? We wanted to reduce the impact of these issues for neighboring projects. So we took on board all these lessons and we tried another path. So your path was building that separate account for each customer, which provided greater isolation greater protection. It removed some of these constraints of building a massively peered interconnected network. Um, it was all our interaction through AWS or through APIs. There was uh, much less need for actual network connectivity between different accounts. And there's no limit to the number of accounts you can create with AWS. Uh, our new architecture was based on microservices. So what does this mean for us? Well, there are going to be lots of applications, hundreds of them. How do we manage all these apps? How do we deploy them? How do we patch them? How do we secure them? Um, one of our design principles for these microservices is that they would abstract a lot of the services and resources they were using behind APIs. Our systems wouldn't share resources like a database. Um, they would have to put that beside, behind something like an API. This means that the impact for changes is highly localized. Um, we also wanted to use the principle of least privilege, and every application is only given access to the resources it needs. So, how did we do this? Well, all our AWS instances would be using IAM policies uh, to access AWS managed services. Um, AWS provides two options uh, for controlling which resources you have access to, ARNs and TAGs. ARNs is the AWS resource name, which we could create a namespace for each application. So this example uh, shows an S3 bucket uh, for a dashboard application. Uh, it's being accessed by an application that is just called dashboard. Um, which is assigned a policy that would only allow it access to this resource. However, AWS arms are not available across all resource types. Uh, for example, EC2 instances. So we also had to use instance tags. Uh, tagging can be also very useful for housekeeping, and billing reports, and just knowing what resources are, are doing and who owns them. Uh, and also applications themselves to reference. Uh, in this example, we have an IAM policy that allows an instance uh, that's running a dashboard application to call the describe EC2 API uh, in order to get information such as the IP address of another server. Um, tags are not ideal, but a combination of tags and uh, Amazon resource names allows us to tie down most things. It's difficult to get 100% coverages, and some services are better than others. For anything that can't be locked down, um, we also have audit logs to fall back on. Um, in order to find out, for example, uh, which application made a call to delete a certain resource, um, or which application was just making a high number of calls to EC2. Uh, we used Amazon CloudTrail um, to create a massive audit log of all the API calls in the account. Next, we looked at the deployment model, um, a comparison between having treating application servers as pets versus cattle. Um, we should no longer be looking after our servers individually and upgrading them and tending to their individual needs. We need to treat servers like cattle, like a utility service. Servers should be created and terminated when needed. 
So how do we do this? Um, we created pre-baked AMIs to configure common tools for everyone. Um, these are version controlled and you can use the same image for development, testing and production. Most servers are stateless systems or would be. They would hold their state in separate data stores and not actually on running virtualized these two servers. Security patches can be applied on boot and we can make sure that applications are rebooting regularly by using auto scaling to do that with no downtime. The advantage of this reproducible infrastructure is it can just be created and stored on demand. If the server fails, we can just auto scale another in. We can make sure most of our systems can tolerate failure by running a Chaos Monkey, which is an open source tool that Netflix uh, developed. This will just regularly terminate random instances every hour. Now, instead of being told that something is broken, we get a notification to say that something has fixed itself. So how do we bring this all together? I mentioned that we deploy our apps using AWS Elastic Beanstalk. Beanstalk handles some resource cre creation at deployment time, but we needed some orchestration around all of that. So we start by registering each application and its owner, an application ID that distinctly identifies it, and related apps are put together in an app group. This is stored in an application called the App Registry. Next, we have a tool called Cloud Provisioning. This will create an application context and the static dependencies around it. Um, so the Beanstalk application namespace. This will create an IAM policy that's used for runtime and deployment. Uh, DNS entries, um, provision SSL certificates. Um, we also had that AMI build automation. This is running on Go continuous delivery and we used the Packer tool from HashiCorp. Um, we had masterless puppet scripts that were doing local configuration management on the actual systems themselves. And finally, a tool called Scotty, which handles the deployment of the application war file, uh, in the case of Java, uh, cloud formation scripts, resources, and config files into S3. Um, this also gave us the option that we could use blue-green deployment to allow applications to do very simple backout. So, how do we make sure this deployment process is working? Well, we do the same things as the development teams do. We wrote our own Java application to be deployed to AWS alongside all the other business applications. This proves the deployment process. There's also the dual benefit that it's also running some service checks against Dynamo or S3 or Logstash. If a development team has problems, they can check our reference app um, to see if this is a local issue or an AWS service issue. So we could deploy hundreds of systems from a complete standing start, and we were doing hundreds of deployments every single day, fully automated from end to end. Using AWS Elastic Beanstalk, 250 plus microservices, over a choice of stack types, so Java, Python, Node.js, choice of different server types for performance, CPU, memory, and doing blue-green deployments, and using highly available managed services where possible. So, lessons learned. Limit the number of options to start with. Uh, communicate with your development teams early and often. Um, try and seek joint enterprise between you and a cloud provider. And speak to platform providers um, because they really do want you to help and improve their service. Thank you.